Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV and a rare Sunday show, but what a show it's going to be. If you've seen Michael's previous appearances on World War II TV, you know you're in for a treat. We are looking at the Les Moulin area of Omaha Beach with Michael Ackerman. Michael is a filmmaker and artist and has become a bit of an Omaha nerd, which I use those two words as a compliment, not any kind of disparaging uh, uh, insult. It is complete compliment. And Coming from the tour guide world, although I don't do as much guiding now, Mag was out today on Omaha Beach. Les Moulins is the area that most people would agree is the most changed. It's where the restaurants are. It's where the um, uh, the museum is up, the, up the, the draw as you drive towards Saint Laurent, monuments, bus parking, things like that. And therefore, it's probably the least understood of the Vida Snozness. There are other ones left and right areas that perhaps have a bit more authentic feel to them so Les Moulin is the one we can all drive past all stop at but talk the least about but to correct that we're going to bring Michael in and talk about it so um good afternoon Michael how are you today I'm very well Paul thank you thank you for having me and I appreciate the nerd uh, comment I am proudly a nerd when it comes to this stuff we all are but we're not real nerds because we're communicating to other people real nerds don't leave their basements we're that's right nerds. yeah we're we're, <laughs> yeah. we're we're kind of you know out there sharing stuff and you know, what's amazing, and people who have seen the previous shows with you, is, you know, I have to underline this point, you've never actually set foot on Omaha Beach. I have not. Um, shamefully, I have to admit that. It's just funny because most people I talk to, when we talk about stuff like this, they have been there and they have seen everything, you know, uh, up close and personal and stuff like that. And they say, well, when I visit, and it's great because they can tell me, like, when I visited, I noticed this, this, and this, this. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. That's something I can, you know, take a note on. But I myself have never had any actual uh i've never been there so it's uh that's going to change obviously but the thing obviously but the thing is you come at this from a more objective point of view because those of us that have spent a lot of time there we are affected by how things are today you see it yes. again again with things i mean even like the the case made uh, at vierville sur mer that, that at the time had the kind of stepped wall but now has yes. a triangular wall that affects people's understanding about how those bunkers were were built, how they were set up. And so, yeah, maybe coming at it and just looking at the contemporary photos. And, this is, you know, I remember you said to me on Facebook once, uh, you'd been just looking at a photo, I think, before going to work or something, and six hours later you realized you'd spent something like that looking at one one aerial photo or something like that. And that's yep. the sign of, uh, of the detail you go into. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, you, you just become obsessed. Well, that's what happens when you're an obsessive, you know, um, perfectionist and such like that. You know, like that's because I am that same way with my art. It's the same way when it comes to research and such like that. So, yes, absolutely. There's been many times where it's like, man, I dwelled on that photo or that just that one little insignificant thing for so long. What I always think is funny, too, about it is that the people who built it um, spent time there and encountered it during the war. Like, you know, it was it was a fleeting thing out of their mind it didn't matter at all to them but to me it's like oh it's like an obsession for some reason so it's a uh, it's a very interesting um way of looking at things and uh, you know yeah. for some reason why it, why it something specifically grabs you it's like the conversation we just had with world war ii veterans where as a, as a living historian we'd ask them how did you fix your shovel to your <laughs> belt or something did you have it on the left side and they go I don't know. I just yeah, uh, I don't remember that crap. I didn't, give it, I didn't give it any thought, and they would be they would be baffled why we would want to hone in on a detail that they had long since forgotten and didn't I, care about at the time. Absolutely, yeah. That's a whole other um, uh, audience when it cut like you know you go to to veterans for certain things but they, they don't give a crap about stuff like that you know like well and also and just just to go off that for a second like i've had debates with people um over certain um parts of omaha beach fortifications and such and um just for example i'm not going to say any any names or anything like that but um this guy was saying that uh he said my grandfather told me that that german bunker at wn72 had a machine gun in it he said he was Somewhat, you know, he said there was a machine gun in it, and I was saying, well, no, there was an, uh, you know, pack forty three forty one eighty eight, you know, eight point eight centimeter gun in there, and uh, he was saying, no, he was telling me there was a machine gun in there, and I'm like, well, okay, tell me the tell me the whole story exactly. He said, well, he said he was running, and the, he, they were getting shot at from the right, and then you know he looked over and he saw that a bunker there, and I'm like, okay, well. He probably was being shot at and then just looked over and saw that bunker and thought that must be where it's coming from. You know, yeah. it doesn't mean he was right or wrong necessarily. I mean, he, he was wrong, but it doesn't mean that, you know, he uh, is an idiot or anything like that. It's just that 
when you, you don't care about that stuff, those guys weren't bunker experts or anything, you know, no, it's like, no, Oh, it's, no, it's a I, big I, yeah piece of cement with a, with a hole in it. That's a bunker, you know? And it's that whole oral history aspect that is mm -hmm. fascinating and important and, and their memories can be true to them, but they just don't tally up with exactly the reality of what the, the as you said, the geography was because they were there for a fleeting moment. And people like you and me, we spend <laughs> more time than is really, um wisely should be spent on these things but anyway you've come on with a powerpoint people are here not to listen to us talking about vegetables they're here to about talk about omaha beach so we're going to kind of just let you take us through the powerpoint and um and folks from the far away with questions and particularly you know constructive comments as, as michael said there if you've been there if you've seen things if you've had, had a look at certain bits of paperwork and data because none of us have read it all looked at it all um, and then we'll just have a just discussion about this position here. So, um, so basically yeah. over to you, Michael. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, Paul. Um, so yes, we are focusing today on Stuttgart St. Laurent sur Mer, uh, of, of Omaha beach, which was the central German strong point of the entire German, def uh, a band of German defenses that overlooked the five mile strip of Omaha beach. Um, so I'm not going to be going too in depth about U.S. Uh, and like the stuff that happened on D-Day with the Americans and stuff. This is solely focused on the geography, the uh, defenses themselves, and how those were implemented. Let's say. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much about like the events of D-Day. That's something for another episode. But um, just to start, I think that it's important to know really, yeah, like just the overall geography of this. And I, the, what better tool is there for that than Google Earth? And um, so right here, as you can see, we got France there in the center. And um, we're going to go in, zooming down into, uh, into Normandy and Calvados specifically. And there, right there, is the entire strip of Omaha Beach. And um, now, and this is, so this is all contemporary. This is how it looks yeah. today. And um, as everyone here should know that the, uh, or maybe not everybody knows, but the Americans divided the beach into certain sectors. And those are all listed right here. Um, now, the funny thing is, is that the Germans pretty much did the same thing when it came to their defenses. They divided their, um, their sectors or their points of defense into Stützpunkt or STP, which means strong point in German. Now, on the west, we have Stuttgart Vierville, Stuttgart Saint Laurent sur Mer, and then Stuttgart Colleville sur Mer. And um, these Stuttgarts were made up of various resistance nests, you know, WN, Widerstand's Nest, um, WN for short. And um, so basically, a Stuttgart is a area of many resistance nests. That's what a that's what a stuck point is. Just to go over some basic stuff here before I know last time I was on we didn't really go over this, so I thought I would kind of give a little geography on how this whole thing worked and some of the uh, terminology. Um, now the reason why these were called stuck point Vierville, stuck point Saint Laurent, stuck point Colville is because they were inhabiting the actual villages. So on the west there we have Vierville sur Mer, obviously. On the complete other side we have Colville sur Mer, and then right smack dab in the middle. We have Saint Laurent sur Mer. Uh, usually, the most kind of forgotten it seems when it comes to um, the towns. People always talk about Colville. They talk about Vierville. Um, Saint Laurent seems to be. It's not. I don't want to say neglected, but it just does not have as much um, focus on it as other uh, as the other two uh, villi French villages, in my opinion, that were part of Omaha Beach. It's because I think it's it's people pass through it. You know, the, the, the yeah, the last twenty years has been the interest in Omar is driven by the tour operators of, of different sizes. And it just seems to be you stop at the western end at Vierville and then you go to the cemetery and do stuff near the, the, the eastern end and, and people pass through this area. The, the, the Saint Laurent is, is, is the bit you're going from one to the other. Uh, and mm -hmm. again, it's where the cafes are, the restaurants are. And uh, yeah, it, it, it is definitely the overlooked part. Yeah, even though I, it's probably the largest. I mean, it's or you know one of the largest. It's it's pretty big. But um, so the funny thing too about Saint Laurent, kind of like Vierville, is that it also led down to the beach. And the hamlet that was on the beach that was part of Saint Laurent was called Les Moulins, which is right down here. This is how it looks today. So we had WN sixty six, WN sixty seven up on the plateau, and then on the opposite end of the ravine, we had WN sixty eight A and WN sixty eight B. So those were the actual German strong points within the area of Les Moulins. But pulling back to the actual town of Saint Laurent, we have WN69, 
which was completely inside the village. And then way on the west, which is a bit unusual, we had WN70. Now, this was within the vicinity of Veerville. And um, a lot of big, you know, famous houses. You can see um, one of the most famous houses is, is right down there today, uh, right underneath the, the spot where WN70 was. Um, even though it was part of Veerville, it was the nest was part of same of Stuckpunt Saint Laurent, not part of Stuckpunt Veerville. So kind of interesting. And the same thing happened when it came to parts of uh, geographical parts of Saint Laurent merging into Stuckpunt Colville. And that's something for another video. But uh, just very interesting that WN70 was actually part of Stuckpunt Saint Laurent, not Stuckpunt Veerville. Hmm. Yeah. So that is all of Stuckpunt Saint Laurent right there, laid out on contemporary Google Earth. So, little bit of a uh, little bit of a backstory when it comes to Saint Laurent sur Mer. Um, since the 11th century, uh, like many seaside villages in Normandy, Saint Laurent sur Mer had uh, gradually transformed into a summer resort. Um, initially, the village included a uh, few. Oops, sorry. Initially, the uh, the village included a feudal mount, which uh, was where the church was eventually built in 1065. That's the church right there in that photo. That photo was probably taken sometime in the 19 teens or 1920s. Um, one interesting thing is that uh, when Napoleon Bonaparte uh, established the continental blockade during the Napoleonic Wars, a network of guard posts had been established all along the uh, the coast and uh, known as customs houses, these little tiny huts basically for guards to post up on, you know, to for guarding the coast, preventing smugglers and such like that, crimes and all that stuff. I mean, there were no cop cars back then, you know, so that's what you had to do if you were going to patrol the area. You had to have a little, a little station. And um, so these guard after the Napoleonic Wars, though, these guard houses within the uh with all along the french coast were still there and um they were manned by local police officers all through the 1800s and even into the early 1900s and um uh so yeah they were still used all up through you know 19 teens 1920s and um these guard houses these little tiny uh, customs houses were there up until world war ii they were still there on world war ii this photograph right here of the uh, western, or sorry, the eastern part of Les Moulins shows um, one of the the uh, the customs houses that was remaining there on the uh, on the the escarpment there. Uh, two of these uh, old customs houses remained at Saint Laurent. Two, they were on both sides of the ravine. You know, one on the western side, and then one on the eastern side. This right here is the one on the eastern side. Um. So kind of just cool. the only one I know of that's still existing is the one way to the east, uh, between Fox Green and you know, so the end of Omaha and um, oh. Saint Honorine des Pet. Isn't that one like on a like basically yeah. on a cliff? Yeah, if you walk down the beach, you can't get to it because there's like a shelf, like 25 feet of kind of um cliff before you get to it. You have to go either you either climb up that or come down for the top. Mag and I walked there on a lockdown walk, I think it was during COVID times, but yeah, crazy. Crazy. It's funny just that those things, you know, they still exist to this day, even yeah. if they survived the war and all this, you know. Um, so throughout the 1800s, um, you know, uh, Saint Laurent uh, grew with its community, more villas, more, hotel, more hotels and restaurants spread throughout the area. Um, there was a big population growth when the train was finally um, uh uh, included into uh, the area, which would run from different parts. So one of the main parts was from Saint Laurent to Vierville. Um, so that's pretty cool. So these are just various other photographs of Les Moulins right here in the, uh, this is probably 1920s right here. Um, when Les Moulins was, was, you know, finally got established. Um, the reason why it's called Les Moulins is because when this area was first uh, established by local farmers, they built several windmills within this area. And um, so the Les Moulins in, Fran in French means the windmills. So that's why it was called uh, Les Moulins, which means the windmills. And once uh, the population started to boom and a lot of uh, Parisians came and built their uh, their big seaside cottages, like you see in these photos, they took a lot, took out a lot of these windmills. Some of them were even converted into houses, and um, 
that's but the that's what happened. But the the area remained the, the name remained Le Moulin based on the, the its previous usage. But yeah, so over time these seaside cottages were built. They were very nice, as you can see, very idyllic. Um, you know, most of them vacation houses. A lot of them weren't owned by people who lived there permanently. Which is a good time to ask Trevor's question. Trevor said, "Was it a poor part of France?" And it, you know, the the introduction of the railways, and I mean the railways generally in France, when it as the same thing happens in the UK and the US, when people from cities could then get cheaply to the coast for holidays. So Atlantic City in the US springs to mind, and all the places like where I grew up, like Clacton on Sea and Blackpool and South End on Sea. Well, this is the same thing that happens in in France. That that train boom allowed people from cities like paris to get to the coast relatively cheaply for the weekend and so these areas that we talked about it on the vieville show like vieville like saint laurent they see that massive boom in hotels and guest mm -hmm. houses and, and and even casinos further up towards wisdom so maybe trevor they ha it had been a poorer area earlier but that boom in the early 20th century meant that people were starting to bring money into the region uh, yeah, absolutely. And with a lot of these photos, unfortunately, I don't have all of them here, but like with a lot of them, you can see that, you know, these are nice, nicer kind of places. Um, you know, it's not, they're not run down. Um, so then, yeah, obviously, uh, 1940, Germany, you know, goes to war with France and just and occupies France. And um, so then eventually, so then in, uh, what was I going to say? Excuse me one second here. So yeah, 1940, war breaks out. Uh, Germany, you know, invades France. The occupying forces spread throughout the country. In 1942, the concept of the Atlantic Wall is finally put into action under uh, Fuhrer Directive Number 40, and uh, German units start occupying the coast. And um, for our subject, the uh, seven six the seven sixteenth Infantry Division is sent to uh, the Calvados region in Normandy. So that's what the who, this photo right here shows these guys. <clears throat> So, all right, we got a good map here of Les Moulins. This shows the, the layout of Les Moulins at the start of the war, so 1940 to 1942. And um, it's all completely accurate with all these, these different houses right here. So uh, this, uh, this was a little difficult to do. But, but uh, um, this right here shows the actual layout of every... I don't know the name for every single one off the top of my head, but I know most of these houses. Um, so... We'll go back to this map several times. That's why I'm just showing it right now. But um, even though, uh, you know, this is all about Omaha and such, I don't really think that we can talk about Les Moulins, uh, Vierville, or uh, St. Laurent without at least mentioning the uh, Aquatint uh, incident, Operation Aquatint. And um, so uh, I think the best thing to do, though, is just if you really want to do a deep dive on Aquatint, you just got to go watch Paul's videos on it. He did three videos on Aquatint that are amazing, and uh, they go into insane detail. I, I used a lot of your stuff. Uh, there's a lot of stuff about my, with my research from those videos and then books that you recommended for it. But um, basically what happened, and it's funny that a lot, not a lot of people know this, but uh, uh, in, the, in September of... Um, was it 1942? Yeah. There was a British commando raid uh, that accidentally landed on the beach of St. Laurent-sur-Mer right in front of Les Moulins. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me. All right. I just, I just lost my place here. Um, so it was in the middle of the night. And um, basically what happened was that the, the British just, uh, the, the British uh, commandos there, they, they got, overwhelmed by the Germans. It was a complete fiasco. Um, and they, a number of them were killed. A number of them surrendered. Uh, like I said, I'm not going to go into too much detail about it, but it was the first real uh, combat ever that happened within the area that would become Omaha beach, you know, within the, the within the span of world war two. Um, so yeah, it's just a very interesting thing that two years before, um, you know, Normandy, you know, before uh, D-Day and all that stuff, before Operation Overlord and everything, that there actually was combat on the area that would be Omaha Beach. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why I bring this up, though, is because if you look at a number of the German defenses around the area, you can tell that after this, around St. laurent sur mer there was some significant steps taken to prevent something like this from happening again. Obviously in 1942, there were British raids in other parts. Um, the Germans 
you know, were getting paranoid about this kind of thing. And once that happened in, um, you know, in the, the Calvados region, you know, Sam, in front of San Lorenzo Mare, there were some steps taken right after that to, you know, prevent something like that from happening again, because who knows where, where they're going to land. And so, just to jump in, the, the, I think the biggest it. reaction from the Germans to that was the, was the infamous commando order, because at about the same time as Aquatint, there were the raids in the Channel Islands, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what I think most would understand as the biggest thing that comes in it is, and the commando order, if you've done what it is, folks, is that the Germans decreed that anybody found kind of behind the lines, not in uniform, was was could be considered, you know, a, a terrorist. So they they could they could be summarily shot. But the point you're making, which I which I agree, is it also it begins in the what became the Omaha Beach area, the cranking up and the, uh, of of defenses and how they're going mm -hmm. to consider the possibility of an invasion because. These various commando raids have been all across you. There have been some in Norway and Channel Islands, and you know. So, but now suddenly there's a little bit of a focus, a spotlight, so to speak, on on Normandy, which just you know puts that little tick in the column. The Germans, they, they've got their map of the coast, the bits they're worried about, and Calais and Netherlands and Norway. And now suddenly there's a little bit more interest in Normandy, which causes the whole Atlantic War scheme to kind of just um, pause and, and consider where they're going. Absolutely, yeah, and. Um... Well, this right here, I just pulled this up. This was uh, uh, one of the German maps that was made of the whole debacle that happened. So you see right up here, this you know British boat landed on the beach. The Germans that were in these areas around Les Moulins opened up on them, and then that's what happened. Yeah, but um, but no, it, it is interesting because before that, there's not a whole lot of stuff at all when it comes to defenses along the area. You know, there's like some guns out in open places. There's some little positions that were established, but it wasn't big at all. So it, it, it really was kind of the turning point when it came to, you know, cranking up the um, the intensity when it comes when it comes to uh, German defenses in the area. Um, so, yeah, defeated on the beach, small German defenses. So, yeah, these were, yeah, like I said, very pretty small defenses here. Um, going back to the map here. The uh, when it comes to, though, the the first responses of the failed Operation Aquatint, the one that I've been able to discover anyway, and I'm not, I'm not saying that these are facts that I'm saying, it's just that because it's so vague, this is stuff that I have noticed in photographs and you know, studying different reports and such. But the very first thing that I see happening when it comes to trying to prevent this uh, kind of thing happening again was this, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, was this, where I get back on my PowerPoint here was this little blockade that was built here uh, in between these two houses. And um, so, yeah, Le Rizzo and uh, Jean d'Arc um, or Joan of Arc. That's where, that was the name of these two houses right here. And um, so there was this canal that ran through, you know, um, Les Moulins, that ran through the whole thing from the beach back into one of the old windmills in this little quarry area. And um, interestingly, there was this, big concrete wall that was built in between these two houses, uh, Jean d'Arc and uh, Les Rizzo. Um, Why the Germans did not build it closer to the beach, I have no idea. Maybe they were using the canal for something. Maybe it was had some other purpose. But this giant chunk of concrete was uh, built from the house Les Rizzo there on the left to Jean d'Arc there on the right. And this is another one of those photographs from the you know, before the war. Yeah. Um, so this area right here, that's where that big barrier would have been. Now, the funny thing is too, and you probably know this too, Paul, is that this, because you see you see uh, photos taken after D-Day of this thing, and uh, it's been labeled as an anti-tank wall for so much time. Um, however, if it like, you know, they similar to the one in, you know, Vierville, the one, the big chunk yeah. of, you know, stone and, and rock that went across and, and cement. Um, however, if it was, let me just go back here for a second. If it actually was an anti-tank wall, why did it not stretch across the road, you know, uh, across the, the road that uh, basically leads to St. Laurent sur Mer? Um, so that's why I've, I've, uh, I've said it's not actually an anti-tank wall. It's a wall that cut off that canal right there. So the canal couldn't be used by further commandos to infiltrate um, St. Laurent sur Mer. That's what me personally, I believe if someone thinks something else, I mean, I would. Well, before you said, I, I'd already thought of the word infiltrate before you said infiltrate to me, it screams of something kind of 
it, not saying there's paranoia among the Germans post Aquatim, but a kind of a sense of they don't want to be cut off from behind. That that they've that they've been perceiving the Atlantic Wall as this anti large scale invasion, but now they've had this little thing happen that sort of happened in the wrong place, and now they're thinking about what if someone comes in behind us? Because I said we did a show, folks, uh, with with Nick about um, some of the commando raids in the Channel Islands, and they had been you know ten people going up and going up. You know, mount hill paths and coming around and attacking places, or, or 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 moving in for reconnaissance from behind. So maybe the Germans are just thinking that at the moment that's their greatest fear: infiltration and small groups, rather than a big invasion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, like I said, if this was meant for a large, you know, uh, to 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 block large vehicles and such like that, there would have been more than just this wall built between these two houses. You know, yeah. but it is, you know, if people whatever still want to say it's an anti-tank wall i mean you maybe the germans eventually looked at it as such you know once they started fortifying the area but it it is placed right directly you know on that canal um so that's completely what i believe it is here is um a photograph taken a aerial photograph taken in june 30th of 1943 of the area and we can see uh les Rizot and jean d'arc there up in the up in the right corners and then that's the path of the canal right there. If you go back for a second, you can see that little bridge down on the beach that uh, yep. the, the, the road goes over. So that's the path of the canal. And then that's the wall right there. You can actually see it's already built. So this is taken in June 30th of 1943. That wall is already there. So that was definitely built in response to the um, commandos that were you know, landing and such and the aquatint incident, as I call it. Um. Also, uh, and from, this is from the same series of photos. This is uh, the previous photo within the series, uh, uh, the, the the from before the one that I just showed, and this shows the plateau that would eventually become WN sixty seven. Now, the interesting thing when you look at this is that there's something in the center, and uh, again, it's something that I've never really seen touched on before. But if you look closely, you can see an observation post, mm. and um, we go in close here it's very similar when you look at in design to the ones that were at wn62 and wn74 the ones that are there today that are still remaining it's the same kind of that you know schnabel stand kind of shape um uh, made out of concrete and stone and uh so just very interesting that you know after uh aquatint that this sort of thing this observation post pops up within the area where it happened now Another interesting thing is that if you look at other aerial photographs in 1944 leading up to D-Day, this observation post isn't there anymore. So perhaps when they were starting to build WN-67, they thought, well, we don't need this anymore. We're going to take the materials from it to build to actual fortifications, not you know, uh, a lookout post anymore. But I do believe that this was constructed possibly in haste. I mean, it's a very grainy photograph. It could have been also just made out of wood, but um, in response to the Aquatint incident of 1942. And I'm glad, Michael, that you're reinforcing the idea that the Germans sometimes halted things or took things down and went in a different direction because it's mm. it's the argument about places like Maisie Battery, which we're not opening that kind of worm's rabbit hole today, but <laughs> just because there's archaeological evidence of there being perhaps at a site 30 different concrete positions doesn't mm -hmm. mean the Germans had all those 30 positions there at the same time. That might have been 10 that were there and then were abandoned for the building of another 10 and then they moved things again and they took two down to make up. A, you know, that, that the point I'm making is, is it's a work in progress. And I think often yeah. all of us, myself included, we kind of take it that what was there on D-Day must have always been there since the Germans started building stuff in 42. And what you're doing is reminding us that the Germans are are changing their minds based on newer threats and and um, and decision making. Oh, absolutely. I wish that, you know, as we talk about, we're probably going to split this into two parts. But as you get really into um, the the uh, get into WN67 and especially WN68, there is a lot of that to where it was established one way at first and then it changed to something completely different. Um, we can touch on that a little bit later, but uh, no, absolutely. There are many things that when the Germans first got here, established certain things, how they were supposed to be. And then by D-Day, you know, it was changed to be something completely different. Yeah. Um, so going back to the map here, um, let's see here. Let's see. 
So eventually the Germans demolished many of the um, houses within Le Moulin. Uh, a number of them were left. However, as you can see, this is when the war first happened. This is before Aquitint, 1942. 1943, especially during the summer, bam, so many of these houses are destroyed. And it was because, again, they are building up the area for fortifications. They are clearing the path, the fields of fire. And a lot of these places, especially within this area right here, this is the hotel district. These are pretty big houses, pretty big buildings, and they just leveled a lot of them. However, some of them still remained um, by 1943. So these are the ones that remained right here. So at the top there, uh, just to the west of the main intersection there, we have St. Cecil. This was a house that was uh, used by many Germans. You know, that's pretty much the main reason why some of these houses were left is that they'd be used by the Germans. Um, on the uh, the far east there, we have Le Sebludon, which is one of the uh, houses that you see in a lot of photographs after D-Day, you know, kind of a famous uh, landmark when it comes to D-Day photos. Uh, Rode there over back on the um, the western side. That's a very small house, but it was left for some reason. I don't know why. I haven't been able to figure out why it was left. It was very small, but it was there. Um, and then obviously here in the center, we have Le Rizzo, which remained with its anti-tank wall. However, Jean d'Arc, the house that the anti-tank wall was connected to, was demolished. So Le Rizzo, with its big concrete barricade blocking that canal was still left intact um and then in the back here Le moulin does stretch farther back into the ravine uh that that leads to saint laurent however i didn't include some of that just because for this right here we don't need it but um this uh house right here as you can tell it's called Le moulin and it's because it was one of the windmills that was converted into a big house at some point in the probably early 1900s or 19 teens 1920s and um and so that house was called Le Moulin, and that's, that house is kind of what the area was named after. Um, but also, as you can see on here, we have the two customs houses that were remaining that we mentioned earlier. You know, this one right here that remained on the uh, eastern side, and then this one here that remained on the western side. Uh, so those were left, um, even though they were hundreds you know, years old at that point, or just or a hundred so years old at that point, not hundreds of years old. Um, so yeah, pretty interesting. So these are some of the houses that remained. Uh, some of these photos we're looking at are pre-war. Some of them are post-war or taken during the war, at least. So and this we is the, had the question earlier, Michael, about did the Allies use some of these photos for preparation? Well, obviously, the obliques taken from the aircraft, absolutely, they are part of the Allies. Oh, band. yeah. All postcards. We have to thank people like Francois Matty, our mutual friend living on Omaha. There's no way the Allies would have had access to all these different types of postcards. That's a resource that's been built up over the last 20, 30 years by people who live in the area who've been going around postcard fairs and buying up all these postcards. You know, the yep. Allies might have had the odd one here and there, but the amount of photos you've got of the 1920s and 30s would, would I'm guessing, have been a dreamland for the Allies in their planning. I, I doubt they'd have had anything like that number. They would have been. Well, a lot of these are, you know, it's funny. You see a lot of these and they're very, you know... Um, uh, what's what's the word? They're very um, sepia tone and stuff like yeah. that. And a lot of them is because they're aged and uh, just been in people's collections for, you know, 70, 80 years, you know, and uh, eventually, um, well, it, a lot of these were gathered by, uh, I'm pronouncing his name right, Yves Cordell. He's the official historian of Vierville sur Mer. And he has a just huge collection of these postcards. And that's where I got a lot of them from, was from him. Um, thankfully he's, you know, he's a nice enough guy to where he wants people to learn. He wants to share his stuff that he owns. Um, he has some great sources, but that's where a lot of these postcards come from. But yeah, if the Americans, you know, British had these photographs, uh, during the wartime, that would have been, uh, much, <laughs> much better for them. Yeah. But, um, so yeah, the remaining houses, we have St. Cecil. This was left on, uh, on the beach. This was there on D-Day. This photograph right here shows a number of Germans from uh, the 726th Grenadier Regiment uh, practicing on a Polish WZ-30 machine gun in front of the St. Cecil. And the funny thing is that a lot of the guys in this photograph actually have been identified, and a lot of them fought actually at WN-62 on D-Day. This photograph here was taken in 43 when they initially... Uh, became part of the Wehrmacht, part of the 726, before a lot of these guys worked for, were um, RAD, you know, construction workers and such. But um, just very interesting that a lot of these guys who went on to fight 
at WN62 on D-Day first started at Stuttgart St. Laurent right there in front of uh, the Villa St. Cecil. Um, then we have Les Sebludon, which is uh, one of the big houses. That means um, the uh, the Golden Sands, I think, uh, in French. Um, I might butcher some of these French names. Forgive me if you are uh, listening to this and you speak fluent French. Um, but this this giant house right here was left this uh, very uh, picturesque kind of uh, old Victorian looking house was left. This is a, an, a photograph of Le Cèbre Loudon taken on May 19th of 1944, uh, an aerial photograph of a, a, a Lockheed uh, photo, uh, aerial reconnaissance plane passing the coast. Um, so this is about the best photo we can get of Le Cèbre Loudon right before D-Day. Um, Roy Day, the uh, house that was on the western side of, the, uh, of Le Moulin. This is the little guy here in the center. Again, I don't know why this house uh, remained, but it was there on D-Day, and it, it survived after the war. This photo right here is actually taken after the war, so it survived for for um, for quite a bit, I think, up into the 1950s. Um, then we have Les Raison, again, the house that has the uh, giant concrete barrier blocking the canal. Uh, that house remained, and here we can see it after D-Day with some Americans scurrying over the uh, sc the Americans scurrying over the rubble of Jean d'Arc, the house that the anti-tank wall was connected to. But the funny thing is when the Germans demolished a lot of these houses, they just left the rubble there. So when you look at photographs of Les Moulins taken before the war, in like aerial photographs or, you know, uh, maps, and then aerial photographs taken in 44, they just, you can see these white circles where those houses were. And that's just the rubble laying there. They just left the rubble there and would use it for various things. Let me go back to that for a second. But as you can see, there's Le Rizal, um, you know, before the war and then after D-Day, just battered to hell completely. And as you can see, that big concrete barrier there was still was still there, um, you know, during D-Day. During um, it was probably a nightmare to bulldoze that thing yeah and a few people have been commenting in the sidebar about the clearing of the areas around the houses after the demolition of the houses they decided they didn't need it's also about clearing up uh, fields of fire for machine guns and weaponry as well so yep. again the, the the omaha beach of today when you've got a more ha the ha houses and other houses and cafes are in again and there are trees in gardens again and there are fences and walls and things again is you're not getting an an, an, an accurate position uh, a picture of what it was like on D-Day. And again, the, po the pre-war postcards are really good at placing the house in place. But again, you're seeing the walls, you're seeing the trees, you're seeing the stuff that, that obviously was was removed in 43. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, so it's just, it just uh, the uh, these poor houses were just, you know, horrible victims of whoever was, <laughs> was in the area during the war. Um, so then farther inland, you know, we have the Les Moulin house. This was one of the big houses that used to be a windmill that was converted into a house. Um, this, the funny thing is this house is still there today. Um, if you go to Les Moulin, I, I only know this because of Google Earth, <laughs> but uh, this house is still there today. So it has survived the war, thankfully, and is there for people to still see it. Can you um, pop back to the photo of the the the, the alleged anti-tank wall, the wall? Because Rob Crane, who's doing all the work on the COP surveys, he asked, uh, "Where is it? What is at the end of it? A square?" And I'm not sure. Is, are you talking about the 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 on the far right there, Rob? This right here, this part yeah. right here. I well, what I because I've looked at that too. What that looks like to me is pieces of cobblestone from the house that were. That, that that this was eventually you know when they built this that this was mushed into basically so this would right. have been just part of the wall of Jean d'Arc the other oh, house like, a, kind the of like a cornerstone of of the of the house okay yep. yeah. yeah exactly so that's what i believe this to be is cuz then when they built it they would have built a giant mold you know casting and stuff like that and the the concrete when it was poured would have just gone right up to the walls of the house yeah and, so, okay, that's the why the concrete has survived whereas the stone has just kind of yeah okay we mm -hmm. makes sense perfect thank you yeah, absolutely. But again, people, yeah, this is not an anti-tank wall. I see it, you know, mentioned as an anti-tank wall all the time. On D-Day, this uh, th this rubble right here, this was not a, a result of D-Day. This would have been here before D-Day. It would have looked like this during D-Day. There would have been this huge passage right here that this a tank could have easily gone around this thing, which it doesn't make sense anyway, because a tank is not going to go up a canal, you know, to to uh, to try and get in into the ravine. So 
the house Le Moulin, again, survived the war. Very nice, giant house. And I'm very glad that it survived the war. That's the one thing that's kind of, I don't know, um, that when you reflect on some of this, when you're looking at these photographs of these old houses, it's just that, oh, it's a shame that that's not there anymore. Because, you know, it's you get obsessive about these things. and But, okay, and then here's, again, one of those two customs houses that was, that was left there. Uh, we don't have a photograph of the one on the western side but we do have photographs of the one on the eastern side so this is the one on the eastern side <clears throat> okay so let's see here where am i sorry and we're loving this. it by the way people are people are having a great time and um the graphics are getting a full full mark so um yeah and, and i'm having a great time are you having a great time <laughs> uh, i'm having a hell of a time man so uh yeah, thanks for having me on because this stuff is awesome i love talking about it i love you know going into all these details and discussing it with people um in this case so yeah let's see here oh yeah so so before i let me go back here for one second here so before we go on to further things involving les moulin the one thing um that we should probably talk about is uh, Boulevard de Chavonnet. Um, now, Boulevard de Chavonnet is, it's again, it's not part of Saint Laurent or Les Moulins, but it was in the vicinity of Saint Laurent sur Mer. So it's again, it's it's an interesting thing where different borders of different things are kind of overlapping each other. So if we leave Les Moulins for a second, we go over to the western end. We have all these houses here, and this was part of what is known as, uh, excuse me, one second as Boulevard de Chavonnet. A lot of people call it a uh, Hemel à Patre. Um, it's actually not called that. Hemel, Hemel à Patre refers to a hamlet within Vierville, uh, farther inland. And the reason why this has always been mistaken is that is since the, I believe the 1800s, the placement of Hemel à Patre on the map has always kind of moved up a little. And so by the time the U.S. were making their own maps of the area and studying previous maps from, you know, decades before the war, they... Saw they thought that this strip of houses here was was um Hamel, Hamel Apatre, but it's actually not. It has no official name. It's I refer to it as Boulevard de Chavonnet because that was the French name of the road that ran along the beach here. And uh, so yeah, just Boulevard de Chavonnet East is what you can call it because the road leading from you know the Vierville uh, draw all the way down here was just called Boulevard de Chavonnet. I hope I'm saying that right. I'm probably not. But um, so on the uh, the very left here, we have, uh, I don't know how you say that in French, Le Hortisian, but uh, it means the hydrangeas in French. I know yeah. that. We're just and, saying it's Hortensia. Yeah. Hortensia. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to get it right either. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> the hydrangeas is much easier. Let's just the hydrangeas, yeah. Now, that also is a very popular house because, again, it still remains today. And um, an interesting note is that it belonged to Michael Hardaway. It was his family's house. Um, however, during the war, Michael Hardelay was a French, um, a, a French citizen of Vierville sur Mer. He eventually became the mayor uh, years later. But um, he was there on D Day, back in the town, in a house that he was forced to live in because once the Germans occupied the area, they wanted to occupy a number of houses along the beach. And um, the hydrangeas, as we're calling it now, uh, was one of these houses that was actually used by some Luftwaffe officers that were in the area. Um, so, yeah, they made him leave his house and he had to live within the town of Vierville sur Mer during the war. And um, so just kind of interesting. But uh, he's uh, he's the guy like in um, what's it called? Uh the longest day. The longest day. <laughs> yeah, the guy in the night shirt who gets all excited when the bombardment starts. That's it? yeah, that's meant to be him um, because he's mentioned in the book The Longest Day. I just think it's the funniest thing is that if because I have a testimony written by Michael Hardelay in French, I had translated to English. And um, the one thing that's to note is that he was not an old man. He was like 30 something years old and uh, he didn't li he didn't live with his wife. He lived with his mother. And um he talks about when that happened. It, it was, I mean, he was not excited. He was like, he was scared, you know? So yeah. it was, it was the opposite of what's in that movie. It, he uh, spent the entire day in his uh, underground shelter that he dug in the backyard of the house he was staying in. Um, so and it's funny because if he had been staying in that house on D-Day, he would have died because the roof was completely caved in by the, uh, the bombardment and all the mm -hmm. fighting that day. Um, so continuing on, uh next house 
that we have is uh let's see here so Le Savoir. I don't know how to say that again. Um, Savoir, yeah. Savoir, um, yeah. That's the uh, the house uh, right next to um, the the hydrangeas. Um, continuing on, we have the Villa Richard or Richard. Um, this house, it's interesting when you look at pictures of this house during the war. It is completely flat on top. And when I initially saw that, I thought it was very strange. I'm like, I have never seen a house from this time period in France in Normandy that has this kind of modern blocky, you know aesthetic to it but i came to find out it's because this house out of most nearly all the houses in the area was stripped like crazy by the germans when it came to um yeah, all of the resources the wood probably a lot of the stone but probably a lot of the wood um that made up the roof and all that stuff was stripped a lot of it was stripped by the germans to build their fortifications when i first saw photos of it it was after d-day and i thought maybe it was also destruction but then I looked at aerial photos, um, recon photos of it taken in before D-Day, and it looked it was all flat. So the Germans stripped the hell out of this house when it came to its resources to use for their fortifications in the area, probably for WN-70 because it's right behind it. And that, that brings up a really good point about the Germans struggling to find timber by, by, by late 43, 44, because... Well, they were struggling with everything. They were struggling to get cement. They were struggling with everything, workers and everything. But timber particularly was the thing. It's why you see, the, and if you know this, folks, I apologize. It's why you see the construction technique of bunkers go from the, the prefabricated for, wooden forms where they pour concrete in to the, 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 the 44 building of concrete bricks on site and then, you know, cementing them together to make a wall because they're so short of timber i mean they've got plenty of timber it's in the reichswald forest they just can't mm. transport it to the uh, coast without the ninth air force and the second tactical air force bombing the shit out of it so the fact they're stripping houses for timber and things like that doesn't surprise me at all but it's nice to kind of have it uh, actually evidence of it yeah absolutely oh absolutely and that's that's one of the biggest uh pieces of evidence of it and um i i I can pull it up maybe later, but yeah, I can show you photos where it's the top of it's flat, but um, it's something also just people don't really think about, you know, when they think of fortifications and how they were, they just think that, oh, they built them and that's it. And it's like, no, there was a process to this and, um, and a, a reason for a lot of it. And uh, it was not as idyllic as a lot of people might think that, you know, oh, they came in, they built these. It's like, no, they were, they built them by various means that they had to work with. <laughs> you know, it was, it was uh, what they had to work with at the time. The, the funny thing, if I can go on a little thing right here for a second, yep. that I find very hilarious about what the what the Atlantic Wall is usually depicted as when it comes to movies and video games versus how what it really was. It's funny to me. It's because how it's usually depicted in movies and video games is what the Germans wanted people to believe. Oh yes, it's it's the um <laughs> it's the it's the end the end of what they were trying to get. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's like, I mean, when we talk about Jersey on the channel, Jersey was the show catalog of what the Germans were trying to do with Atlantic Wall everywhere. That's where they, like on a, in a housing area development, they build the show house to sell all the, to show the people who, this is what the house is going to look like. That's what Jersey was. I mean, the percentages of the, non, if, you, if you look at the five landing beaches, the percentage of actual finished, finished Vidas Nosnes is something like 30% or something. I mean, the great majority yeah. were, were not finished. They were in, in development. There's, there's concrete there started but not finished and and it's you know we had the question coming i'll just do this peter o'connell is asking um uh what proportion of local population got dragooned into forced labor fortification well that's an issue that that was plaguing the germans across the atlantic wall is that they're moving they're losing what workers are dying they're getting illnesses they're moving their factories underground in germany and silesia places like that and and where in the early part of the construction, 1942, the Germans would be bringing in all sorts of workers from even Belgium and Poland and other places. By 44, they just nobody. There's nobody left. They've moved. The, the, mm -hmm. the locals are too busy trying to feed everybody. They're doing agriculture. So you'll find a lot of these cases, the actual German troops themselves are doing construction work because because they're the only people available. Which means if you're spending time as a soldier, you know, with your sleeves rolled up mixing concrete you're not practicing rifle drill you're not practicing gunnery so so the germans are struggling with manpower in terms of construction up and down the coast so th th so there's a that's a that's a massive subject in its own right the german use of 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 labor to build atlantic war but that would be my kind of brief thoughts on it uh today uh, yeah I, I, and i i agree with you completely um 
Now it's interesting if uh, when it comes to it, just one more thing about the uh, the Low Richard right here. Um, here's uh, I just want to pull this up real quick. Uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, never mind. I'll pull that up later. We'll, we'll worry about that later. But uh, we'll stick to the presentation here. Um, so yeah, just uh, it, it's it's also interesting though talking about you know demolishing things and using resources and such. The Germans did not demolish any of these houses along Boulevard de Chavonnet. They stripped some of them, like Richard, you know, and, and requisitioned them. But these all of these houses were there on D Day. Yeah. So just kind of interesting. Even their little you know some of the some of these little green houses and these little guest houses that they had, they were also there. So moving on, uh, grain de sable, uh, which I think just means grain of sand in it French. Does, yep. Um, so that ho- that's another one of these houses. I don't know the story to every single one of these right now, unfortunately, but I'm, I'm trying to uh, eventually learn the story of each one and the, the inhabitants there. Uh, Sheffer, uh, just another one of these houses. Uh, as, again, it's it, we're very lucky that we have these pre-war photos of them to see what they were, they they look like in their prime. Um, uh, healing, uh, another one of these these big houses. Uh, this one's neat. Uh, La Source. This is owned by uh, uh, Francois uh, Mate. I think yeah. uh, is how you say his name. Yeah, he's a friend of ours. Um, he's one of the uh, guys who helped write what we call the Green Book, which was uh, this book right here. This is probably the best book on uh, Omaha Beach research. Um, he lives that. That's his family's house. He lives in that house. And, um, you know, he posts uh, photos of it all the time on Facebook and such. But, uh, yeah, he he still lives in that house. It's still there. We've been to a barbecue there. Very nice it was. <laughs> I hope to someday to do the same. Um, Claire Fontaine, this house, um, even though it's it was massive, this house just, for some reason, when you look at the aerial photographs taken on D-Day, this house was obliterated. Uh, this house must have received a direct hit from the Navy or a bomb from the pre landing bombardment that um, was lucky enough to get that close because this house, when you look at 8 a.m. photos on D-Day, this house was completely annihilated. Um, just kind of interesting. And it's, it wasn't destroyed by the Germans because the recon photos taken May 19th shows it completely intact. So it wasn't destroyed for uh, resources. Then the last house is Brissé Um This is a, uh, the last house here. Interestingly, uh, if we just go, I, I said, I wasn't going to go much into the Americans, uh, part of the battle at all. But if you look on the map here, right behind um, Brissy Colleen, that is what we call Coda's draw. That's where Norman Coda went up uh, on D-Day up the escarpment. So his Coda's draw is directly behind Brissy Colleen or was, I should say. Um, So yeah, just, just pretty interesting there. Now here's just some aerial photographs taken on June 3rd of 1943 that show kind of how the area looked right in the middle of this transformation phase. Um, you know, like I said, we have the Seblu Dawn right down there on the beach. Um, then right next to, on uh, on the photo, on the right side of the photo, to the left of, what would be to the left of uh, Le Seblu Dawn is a Hotel Flotz. Uh, as you can see, the roof is completely stripped off of that thing. So that had been complete, that was probably being used for uh, various resources within the area. Uh, this is the next photo in the same series of these aerial photographs. Uh, we have down there on the left, right in front of the beach, uh, St. Cecil, that uh, the first house that I mentioned. And the, right in the center of this photo, kind of at the foot of the plateau, we have Roy Day, that house uh, that was left remaining there for some reason. I don't know why. Um, nearly all, the, all these other houses, though, were destroyed um, throughout 43. That house, I forgot what that house, that was a hotel, but uh, that was also destroyed. And then here we're getting into uh, Boulevard de Chavonnet. And uh, we have Villa Richard there kind of in the center with its very lush garden. Um, and then right on the right there, we have uh, the, um, what's it called? The the hydrangeas. It's yeah. sometimes today referred to as Villa Hardelay, uh, named after Michael Hardelay, I guess, we, as we talk about the owner of it. But uh, so that is a good series of recon photos taken in, on June 30th of 43 that show this kind of transformation phase as things are starting to be built, uh, but haven't quite gotten there yet. So um, going back to Stuttgart, St. Laurent, sur Mer, some of these German fortifications, 42 to 44. Um, now, Paul, as you already know, because you mentioned this in your Aquatint video, when the Germans first came here to establish these uh, points of resistance, they were not called the, they were not given the names that they became known as uh as, as let's say on D-Day, 
So um, let's go back here for a second. So uh, if we look at this map right here, you can see that what would be uh, Stuckpunt Saint Laurent, you know, WN66 to WN70, it's called 29 right here. And it's an, it was an interesting kind of system that they first had, which was they would call it an air, they would name an area, you know, a Stuckpunt, uh, they would give it a number. And then the WNs from that Stuckpunt would be, you know, W, let's, for this example, WN 29 A, B, C. Yeah. <clears throat> so when it was first established, they, it was not what it became known as for the D Day. This area right here on top of the plateau was WN 29 A. And then down here, right in the front of uh, Le Cebu Dole was 29 B. And then kind of at the intersection right behind uh, St. Cecil was 29 C. And weirdly, so, the Germans, when they they do some uh, uh, renumbering and uh, on the, what became the Utah sector as well, but they didn't look at that. They didn't like wipe it all out and start again. Some some they change and some they left. So the numbering is weird. You know, it, you you'd, you'd think it would make sense if you kind of start in Cherbourg and go to Le Havre, that the numbering would kind of make some kind of and it nearly does. But there are these big bits where it just goes completely wrong where they where they change the numbering halfway through. So it's it's a typically German nearly organized but with enough gaps in it to make it confusing 80 years later absolutely yeah it's like because i've um i'm very much a novice when it comes to utah beach defenses and such like that but yeah it's like what is it wn5 or something yeah. like that is yeah one of them is like what um very weird it's and some of them like uh yeah uh i think point to hawk is a stick point 75 a or something is what it's called. something like that yeah yeah uh it's it's strange so um yeah, and 43 at some point, I noticed this because I was looking at the maps, and that one that I just showed is the earliest one I can find that has the original names for all of the uh, the resistance nests. And then the next one in 1943, early 43, has the ones that we now all know. So at some point in between 42, 43, the names are changed, and then we get what we know. Uh, there's the destruction of the houses, and then we get what is known as WN66, WN67, WN68, and then WN69 and 70 uh, on other parts that are not shown here. But um, so let's first go. Well, we'll go into WN66. Like I say, we'll we'll save the other ones because it's so much to get into. We'll save them for another time. But WN66 is the first one that we'll really dive into. So WN66, the first thing that would have been built at WN66 was a ring stand uh, 1694 for a KWK 38 L42 gun. And then that gun was later fitted with an L60 barrel. What's the difference? L42 is a shorter barrel. L60 is a longer barrel. Um, and here is, we're going back to that, 19, that June 30th, 1943 aerial photo. We can actually see that ring stand right down there. There it is. Uh, there is a, a, this is kind of, it's very grainy, but you can see that octagonal shape with that gun on the inside of it. Um, and then there is a blueprint for that specific ring stand with the uh, KWK 38 inside it. Now, here are some post D day photos of this, this exact part of WN 66. So this is the exact one that we're talking about. And um, with its KWK L38 uh, L60 gun inside, um, with a lot of these guns along the coast, in fact, I see this a lot in um, photos of at Threadat. I think that's how you say it. Um, these uh, KWK 38s had a lot of these ad hoc makeshift camouflage umbrellas over them, and um, so that's obviously what this is right here. This normally would not be part of the gun, but the Germans felt it necessary enough to put this wood frame. This Almost looks like a piece of fence over I mean, the top. It almost looks like slightly large cocktail umbrellas. They're really, they're, they're really not very sophisticated. I've got a couple of photos of I think it's sixty four or so, and, and it's it's so they're so fragile. I mean, okay, it's for camouflage, not protection, but that yeah, it's like garden parasols. Yeah, I, I think that um, in this case, I mean, you can see a lot of the the bits of wood are kind of you know. Uh, what almost look fragmented and such. So I think that probably with a lot of the fighting that was going on D-Day, this probably got, you know, shredded a bit and you can see a camouflage net dangling off the front of it too. So this uh, would have had that over it uh, in addition to that umbrella. Um, here are just some more photos of the exact same gun within that ring stand. Uh, so it, it's funny though, when, um, when the, when the Germans first established these, 
these um w these these resistance nests the positions are all along the uh all along the beach right here they're all down right behind the shingle embankment um and this is one thing that we'll get into in in you know future discussions on this is that as time went on they would pull them back to the plateau so you see that a lot to where when they're first established a lot of them are these ring stands and these tow brooks right up along the beach right behind that shingle and then as time goes on they pull stuff back and start building bigger things and bigger casemates up on the plateaus because they realize that's actually not a good idea. Um, so the second thing installed here at WN66 was this Tow Brook 58C for an MG34. Um, this is what it would have looked like. This is not a photograph of that specific one. This is just an example, but it would have been in this kind of you know design to where you would have been made to sit inside that um, uh, that hole you know on the top of it and perch your MG34. Uh, on the central um, bipod pivot rather than the um, one down by the muzzle. And uh, that 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 central um, part of the gun to mount your bipod on, that is specifically for a tow brook like this. You know, that's what, that, that's what that's designed for, for fortification. So you can easily sweep like that rather than having to, you know, do that with the gun. Um, so that is what this would have looked like with an MG34 inside it. And then going back to the 1943 uh, recon photo, we see it right there on that little tiny mound. Now, the interesting thing is that if you look at this specifically, you can see that that tow brook has a white thing over it. And that, from what I can uh, determine, is some kind of cover to uh, keep sand and seawater from going inside it. Because when this beach was full, when this beach would get to high tide, this water would come almost pretty much up to the shingle. Still does, obviously. And um, so when I look at a lot of uh, of these fortifications and aerial photographs before D-Day, whether it's a recon plane flying flush uh, with them or one from above, I usually see some kind of case or not case, some kind of <clears throat> lid or cover that's covering the embouchure so water and seawater and sand don't get inside it. And I uh, can further back this up because if you look at photos taken on D-Day of this specific tow brook, this is that exact tow brook right there. You see that white circle off to the side, off to the left of it, where clearly uh, the gunner at the gunner at some point. This moment that alone is why I love having you on, Mike, because I would <laughs> never have noticed that in a photo. The bloody cover is lying there beside the 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 the, 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 the brook, and it you know it also and this this may be kind of patronizing towards some of the people who, who know their history. But I think there are people who think that Germans literally sat in, in those Tobruks 24 hours a day. Obviously, oh, hell no. they were, <laughs> and of course, it's not how it worked. They, 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 ha they are based in, 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 in farms or in barrack blocks, and then they move to positions when there's an alert. But I think people do sometimes believe they're they're, they're just sitting in there waiting behind a machine gun all 24 hours a day. <laughs> Hell no. No, I'm not. Yeah, th th that is funny because, yeah, you do see that a lot. Like, you know, just, oh, of course, they're sitting in their positions. It's like, no, no, no. They would have they'd have ran to those once they get an alert or if they're doing a drill or something like that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that, so that's why when you look at the previous photo, you see that white cover over it. But then in the D-Day photo, you see that hole is open and there's this white circle off to the side right here, which is the lid. Because if. It, it, it something if that was something else it would be here in that photo but um so continuing on so that tow brook was there obviously so there were some uh improvised positions also on the uh western half of uh of the of wn66 some uh just little dug-in positions where you could do uh, either mount machine guns or act as you know lookout posts and such but when i've looked at uh this is part of it right here this little area jutting out right here, I can't determine what that is necessarily, but it's something that jutted out, whether it's just sand with some, you know, uh, some brush around it. But it was uh, quintessential enough for the Germans to utilize it, because when you look at the aerial photographs, you can see these trenches running towards it. And if you really look close, you can see a U shape um, where that where that is supposed to be right here. So here on the right, we have some kind of either a machine gun position or some kind of lookout or something. And then we have this U-shaped position right here, which was on the left, which was pretty common when it came to these trenches and, you know, machine gun positions, because everyone could easily pivot, you know, from one side to a, to the other to shoot. Uh, all right, moving on. Now, as I said before, the, at some point in 43, after the summer of 43, because it was there when we look at the June uh, June 30th photos, Hotel de Flutz was uh, completely destroyed to... Uh, 
to in order to create better fields of fire. Yeah. And also, they probably scrounged a lot of its you know uh, rubble for different things. Um, however, Le Sable is uh, completely is left completely intact, um, which is pretty cool. Well, for the Germans, it's cool anyway. Um, but uh, here, let me go. Where was I? Where was I talking right here? Um, so yeah, the uh, the Villa Le Sable was it was requisitioned by the Germans um, with the cellar, from what I've read anyway, with the cellar serving as a shelter, and then on its roof there was the uh, presence of um, what you call it? Oh yeah, here, right here. With on its roof, uh, they had um, a uh, an, uh, an observer for uh, aerial, um, you know, for for a uh, Luftwaffe observer basically would be there on the top. And it's funny if you look at uh, photos again before the war, and then uh, photos after. If you look at photos before the war, the big tower of Le Sebludo does not have this whatever this thing is lining the top of its tower right here. Um, however, photos taken during the war, there is, whether that's some kind of stone, I, I would assume it was wood, um, but something that where people can, can, uh, go on top of it. I've never so. noticed that either. That's, that's, yeah. that's two <laughs> things. Yeah. <laughs> I feel such an idiot now. And Matt Mag just said earlier, um, about, um, can we all get Michael's glasses? They, they see stuff we don't. <laughs> Are there those X-ray ones you used to be buying from the from the DC comics when you were a kid? That the offers on the back. Is, is hey man, ones? I'm not giving away trade secrets. No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, it's just the the best thing is just to look at all photos of one thing and see when you when they were taken over periods of time and look at differences and things that you notice and you know going by the dates of the photo you say okay at this point this must have happened but yeah when you look at pre-war photos of Le Sable Dog, that top is just it's it's um, flat and it has a weather vane on it. Um, but once you look at wartime photos, it has this bear, this something, this like rail or whatever put up there so people can, can be up there. Um, so then, uh, here, let's go back to our PowerPoint. So then, you know, trenches are installed, um, as well with, uh, what, uh, you know, a little bunkers and shelters, oops, uh, for, uh, uh, what they call a feldmassig, you know, a little shelter or, or uh, where you could store things. And then these two ammo bunkers here for the KWK uh, 38 gun and for the machine guns here that would store all the ammo. These are little bridges that they had going over them, over the trenches. Um, this right here, this is not a photo of WN66. Uh, it is, I don't know where it is, honestly. I haven't been able to determine that. It's a very grainy photo, but it's a good example of what these trenches that were right up against the the shore would have looked like, you know, um, pretty narrow, not a lot going on. And then, um, camouflaged and covered in many places. So, uh, to avoid uh, detection and such. And this is, it's worth going back to the point I said right at the beginning about the Omaha of today, mm -hmm. not always giving us an idea of what the Omaha was like there, because the, the, the other beaches, I, mean, I, I walked the uh, Gold Beach with Rob early this year when he was doing his cop work here, you know, that you get these big, well-established dunes with with plants going growing right in them that, that sit there higher, which means you could put a trench just behind that. So you're not very far away from the beach, but then you could move 100 yards down the beach and there isn't that kind of tufty dune bit. It's it, you know depends where you are. I mean, don't forget, folks, Omaha is four and a half miles long and if you add the sector you, you injure even more miles so it's not consistent all the way down it so i'm a, you know it's a good point maybe to mention michael the fact that in your in your study of this is that the individual if you like refinements put in a vida stances were per presumably on the discretion of the commander how motivated is he is he what kind yes. of you know level of of attention the details he has because you can see you know vida stances a mile apart where one has had all the kind of whistles and bells, so to speak. And the one a mile down the road hasn't because at some point, I mean, obviously there's the shortage of materials, but I think it's down to just the dedication of the individual commanders and how how much extra effort they want to put in to, to camouflaging their position or, or adding the things like the, the communication uh, trenches and that kind of, um yeah, whistles and bells. Absolutely. And, you know, that's why you also you see a lot of things that are uh... – not to not to standard you know there are a lot yeah. of improvised things and uh, it's just kind of like what the because you'll have you know a number of german fortifications that are regal bow and okay those are clearly ones that organization tote wanted to put in there 
And then you have stuff that's very non-standard and just kind of random in design. It's like, okay, that was clearly or possibly designed just by the soldiers who were there. Yeah. You know? So yeah, it, it's really like just, you know, what is standard versus what, what whoever was there decided to do it's very and very interesting the, the particular terrain of features in that some areas lent themselves to kind of improvisation others were just very flat or whatever so there wasn't much room for into like like the the cutting in the wall you talked about on the vierville show was 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 something that was able to be added there because that feature existed and they they put that sort of trench in from behind but yeah it's it's again and we're just looking at one beach and one sector, of yeah. beach, and there's variation within one sector. So when you look at the entire Atlantic Wall, and of, of course, there's loads of different variations and um, um, uh, methods. Absolutely, yeah, and and uh, it, the um, the the level of detail we could get into is endless when it comes to that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I overwhelm myself just with Omaha Beach. People have told me before, oh, you have to study, you have to study, you know, Sword Beach, and just like one thing at a time, dude. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, so, uh, oh yeah, and then in uh, forty three or uh, early, this has actually been uh, forty four. Um, a large anti tank ditch was dug, uh, cutting all the way across Le Moulin, and uh, one of it, what one side of it, uh, did cut along the back part of um, WN sixty six. That kind of staggered, uh, you know, a zigzag kind of trench, very common, uh, and it was filled with water, uh, completely filled with water, so to prevent you know uh, tanks and such from being able to easily maneuver through this area, and um, so that's the anti-tank ditch, and then uh, a giant minefield was installed uh, within this area, and uh, on the maps it's known as MF40. Um, MF39 uh, would have been on the other side of Le Moulin, but MF40 was uh, went, ran along this area around the tank ditch and uh, to the back of uh, WN66. It's funny though, from what I have read, a lot of these mines um, unfortunately didn't work very well because this area is very, um, very wet, very marshy and such. And um, unfortunately didn't work too well when it came to installing a minefield from what I've read anyway. Yeah, makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then that, and then the, this right here is the pattern of the concertina wire of WN66 where they would have laid the, the C wire. Uh, that would have run along the whole area. Um, the The entire um, beach of Omaha the, did not have a continual line of uh, wire, uh, you know, in front of the shingle. There were parts of it that didn't. However, nearly all of the WNs did have wire uh, surrounding them. So, as we can see that here, and then the wire obviously leads back to uh, WN sixty seven. Um. So WN66, uh, at least by the uh, from what I have read, when it comes to uh, June of 44, uh, on the June 5th, the night of June 5th of four, uh, 44, you know, uh, right before D-Day, uh, 18 soldiers garrisoned at WN66. Uh, 10th Company Grenadier Regiment 726. The whole Le Moulin area, Stugpunt, uh, uh Saint Laurent, was uh, manned by the 10th Company of Grenadier Regiment 726, which is part of the 716th Infantry Division. Um, and then there also eventually would have, on D-Day, would have been elements of um, Grenadier Regiment's uh, 916 of the 352nd that would have been reinforcing the area as well. I don't think they would have been, been reinforcing necessarily WN66, but they would have been in the area. Um, so yeah, 18 troops would have manned this area. Their weaponry included one light MG34, so light meaning just that it was used on a bipod. And then they had that would have been in that tow brook, as you can see where the red arrow is there. And then they would have had also two heavy MG34s, which is an MG34 on a Lafette on a tripod. Um, that's how the Germans designate them. When they're on a Lafette, they're a heavy machine gun. Um, so pretty interesting, you know. Uh, there's no records of 42s being used by uh, this unit uh, at uh, at WN66. I haven't found any evidence of that. But um, so, yeah, MG34s. However, when it came to that observation, uh, that Luftwaffe observation post on Le Sebludon, that had apparently one French Mac 31 machine gun used for anti-aircraft use uh, on that, uh, that, and that um, air observation nest up there. So that would have been mounted on the tower of Le Sebludon. Now, those machine guns, they're French. Um, that's a photo of an Ost Truppen with one. And um, 
when these they were initially installed along the Maginot Line uh, when uh, in 1940 for um, fortifications, you know, uh, uh, inside uh, the, the the cupolas and such like that. However, when the Germans uh, occupied France, they took a number of these out and they would fasten bipods to them, you know, uh, other kinds of things. As you can see right here, this very crude uh, 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 mount right here that's nailed or screwed to a piece of wood. And um, they would uh, use them as basic infantry weapons, you know, not uh, necessarily fortification weapons, but just, you know, basic uh, infantry on the ground machine guns. And they um, them, so they use them. It's a, it, it, that's how I, it, they're not they're not ideal for anything, but they've got them. So they, yep. they use them. Yeah. Yep. So it's so like many places that are not the so like many places in 41, 42 that are not the front lines, um, a.k.a. the Eastern Front, you know, or Africa. They're going to use these things in places where they're, you know, where they don't need the state of the art kind of stuff. Um, it's kind of interesting, though, with this this uh, photo, of this guy right here, this Ostrupen. If you look at that um, anti-aircraft, the reason why I use this photo, too, is because it was apparently an anti-aircraft uh, being used as an anti-aircraft gun on top of Les Sebludos. And this shows that kind of configuration and a very, very crude looking spider um, uh, anti-aircraft sight on it. I mean, it just looks like bent metal. Um, not very, not very, probably not very reliable, but I mean, it's a machine gun. I've never heard anything bad about these machine guns, but, uh, yeah, the Germans did, did, uh, um, transform them into infantry machine guns. And this photo, this, uh, video right here just shows one of these guns that was taken from the Atlantic wall. And it has, look at it. It has a bipod on it. And as you can see, it's just a very crude bipod with, um, whatever bar stock was lying around, um, just very interesting kind of uh, kind of interesting transformation, taking these guns that were meant for those fortifications and doing whatever they could to transform it. Uh, that video was sent to me by someone uh, who works at a museum. So I appreciate cool. that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so going back, here's WN66. So we went over everything that, that made up WN66. Um, this right here is an aerial photograph taken uh, – in, on May 31st of 44, so right before D-Day. And then this aerial photograph is the exact same position that was taken on D-Day around, I believe, noon. Um, no real way of telling other than just lo noticing little details. But as you can see, all of the abundance of vehicles up on the beach, there's... Height you know, is high, pretty high. Yeah, yeah, lots of little dots around. So that is that exact position right there. And you can see the ring stand on the right. You can see the tow brook in the center, the communication trenches, Les Sebludons, the house is still there, the giant anti-tank ditch in the rear. And then back here in the very rear is leading to WN67, which is another thing to get into. Um, however, I would like to share, because we're talking about WN67, my latest painting that I did. when In doing all this research, I do paintings of, I'm, I'm also an illustrator. So yeah, I do paintings of this stuff because I nerd out on it so much. Like I but want it, to. It also must help you kind of collect your thoughts by putting Absolutely. it onto paper like that. It, it allows you to go through the process of compiling the stuff you've worked out and, and getting a kind of a visual representation. Uh, I Absolutely. No, it, it is almost like that. Yeah. It's like with some of my earlier stuff, I look back and say, how is that depicted again? Because when I'm painting it, I am completely engrossing myself in all this information that you eventually sometimes, you know, lose off the top of your head. But um, so when I was studying WN66 and the whole, you know, Stuttgart Saint Laurent area, I uh, wanted to do this painting, you know, depicting how it would have looked. So this is my interpretation of Le Cédoudon under the occupation of the Germans, where their emplacement WN66 um was and as you can see that tow brook that we went over that had the lid on it is down there in the foreground on the uh the left and you can see the lid is taken off it as these guys are training on it um because that lid was something i discovered uh just some details doing the you know looking into the house Le said i did a lot of um looked at a lot of photographs taken uh after d-day and obviously a lot of houses taken you know a lot of photos taken before the war to get all these details just right the number of bricks had to be accurate. So it's a lot of uh, work when it comes to a lot of this stuff. And this, what I also do when it taking creative liberty, I try and add things that are, um, you know, that would have been accurate. So in this, this uh, close up right here, going up to the house, we see a, uh, a Zonderfuhr. 
a uh, someone from the propaganda company with his foot with his camera out right here in his hand, uh, you know, kind of documenting the area. And then on the right, we have a just a regular soldier of a uh, Grenadier Regiment 726 uh, eating from, you know, a mess kit. He has his Drillic uh, uh, coat on, not his regular uniform he'd be wearing while he's on duty, but his uh, just kind of workman's outfit that they would wear. Um, and, uh, you know, overseas cap as well. So I also wanted to add, uh, you know, other details that you would have seen during this area, you know, officers on horseback, the G Germans used a lot of horses yeah. uh, in the area. Back way in the background there, we can see the house, uh, Les, Raison, uh, Les Raison, the house that had that uh, giant, um, you know, wall, that barrier connected to yeah. it that, that, that was there left on D-Day. We see that. And then right behind that, we see the house, Les Moulins, the house that was once a windmill that was converted into a house that is still there today. And luckily, because it's still there today, I was able to get all of the colors accurate <laughs> um, mm. when I when I researched it. Everything else, there's some conjecture. But I do know that um, the Germans, I'm mean, not the Germans, the French, when it came to their houses and their buildings, there was a, you know, a lot of this uh, very light kind of light cobblestone and then um, these black rooftops from what I've noticed. Um, kind of up there on the right, we have uh, parts of the rear of WN-68, which is something to cover, you know, later on. Um, here's some detail work of that uh, Tobruk being used during training. The German officer there, the Feldwebel, uh, instructing this uh, young guy on the MG-34, you know, how to... Uh, how to use it for, for shooting back and forth. Um, and then these are guys obviously from the Luftwaffe, um, uh, ob observation unit that would have been there, uh, at Le Moulin using, uh, the house Le Seblu doll. If we go back for a second too, we can see at the very top of the tower, we can see guys looking the guys up there, you know, looking at the sky yeah. Yeah, as yeah, they would yeah. have. Um, so anyway, those are just some details. A lot of this stuff was, again, there is no, um, you know, uh, memoirs from any of the Germans uh, who were in this area. So there is some conjecture when it comes to some of the things on these guys' uniforms and such. But I made sure it was all as accurate as possible. And um, uh, that's one thing that I try to get, you know, as accurately as, as accurate as possible. Now, I know a lot of um, uh, people are commenting stuff on here and, you know, wanting to know different things. And um, so if you have questions for me, just email me. Here's my email. I always love talking about stuff. I'll share my information. I'll share all my photographs. I'm not one of these people who wants to hide everything and, you know, try and uh, say, oh, it's mine. It belongs to me. No, I mean, I love sharing stuff. I think history should be shared. So um, absolutely. If you want to email me, about um, different questions or such, or if you also want, uh, if you want a print of that painting, you know, we can talk about that as well. I do sell prints of it, of my, of my artwork. So yeah, just hit me up. Um, is there anything else, Paul, that, uh, we should go over? I just liked, could you go back to the, uh, the painting and show the, the bit underneath because that house, which also gets referred to post D-Day as Bingham's house. Cause major Sydney Bingham of the one 16th is involved yes. in attacking it. And it gets referred to as the fortified house. Now that's one of those expressions that is really hard to kind of quantify because, fortified people then have this idea that it's packed with guns and sometimes it can mean reinforced it can mean it's what what's your interpretation on what's going on under the house because obviously most of these french houses had a cellar yeah yeah so yeah. So, so you know and I, I it's been a while since i read the bingham account but they refer to coming from under fire from underneath the house so what's your take i know when we're, we're talking more about what the germans put in rather than the american attack but what's your, what's your take on what the germans have underneath it um, under, I'm not sure, honestly, that's one thing that I really need to look at, but I, it, from what I've read that they were using the cellar, um, for basically for, uh, for housing troops. And then the top of it was used for, you know, observation, but, uh, I've seen it referred to as the fortified house a lot as well. Yeah. And clearly the Americans thought that because when you look at photos, if here, let me just, um, let me, uh, since we went over my whole slideshow here, I'm just going to exit it right right now. Um, can I share my screen for one second? Uh, yeah, cool. In one second. Um, clearly, the Americans thought that as well, and that they thought that when it comes to every other house, because when you look at... Um, okay, I'm ready to share my screen again. One second, share screen. Share. Okay, um, now. Uh, one second here. Okay. 
So um, clearly the Americans thought that. So this is Le Seb Ludon. I use it at the beginning of my presentation. But uh, this is a photo taken after D-Day with, you know, a casualty, a, a unfortunately um, deceased man on the ground. But um, uh, if you look at the house after D-Day, it has big holes in it, you know, everywhere. So clearly the Americans, when they landed, they, they considered it fortified. And nearly all the houses, when you look at them, either on D-Day or after D-Day, have giant holes on the front of them. They're not on the back. The Germans weren't shooting at them. The Americans were. So yep. I don't know necessarily if it was considered if it, that the Germans wanted to fortify it in any way they could, but clearly the Americans did think that and probably referred to it as such, you know, because they said that they said they considered the uh, the Gambier house on WN73, the one that um, Ralph Garanson uh, went up. He also referred to it as the fortified house. So it's like, I've never found any evidence of the Germans using it for anything. Um so I think it was just that they would they assumed that these remaining houses were being used as some kind of fortification, possibly. But I have never found evidence. I've never found evidence of the Germans actually doing it. I um I I've you know read stuff where you know they say oh there was this house and we you know had to we shot at it or something like that. But I've never really seen evidence, solid evidence or read solid evidence of they're actually like being like, we had to take out this house because it was being used as something. Um, another thing that I find interesting, just kind of touching on the same thing is that you always hear about the, uh, the church towers within um, St. Laurent, Colville and uh, Vierville being targeted by the Americans. Famously, the one in Vierville was blown up, you know, uh, pretty badly. I mean, they nailed that thing. And um, it's funny. I was talking to Yves Cordell, the, um, the actual historian of Vierville. And he said that the Germans, there's no evidence that the Germans were using it. And he said that the Germans, there's no real evidence that the Germans really used bell towers for anything, but the Americans always assumed they did. So no matter what, they would always destroy a bell tower wherever they were yeah. because they just yeah, assumed yeah. it. And like, and you see that in a lot of depictions, like, Oh, we, there was a, there was an observer, there was a sniper in a bell tower. And it's like, well, Maybe not, but they were just told that there was, you know, or something. It's like, well, there could be one. So just shoot the tower anyway, get it over with. Um, so there, there, that's what I think of when it, when it comes to stuff like this. I don't know if there was ne necessarily anything going on when it came to this house, when it came to it being well, used. I've just um, got a photo out of my, while you've been talking, I've got a photo ready for my collection, which you may or may not have this one here. I um, do have that one, but it's a great is, photo. Is that something underneath? I mean, it, under the railings on the right-hand side, is that a square? Or is, I, don't I know. think I've that's... Never, I, I've never known what that is. I, no, I've looked at... I have another photo that kind of... <laughs> now we're like, I got a photo. I got a photo. Um, but uh, I have a photo that kind of shows a little bit of the same thing that you're talking about, the foundation there. I don't know, honestly. I, unfortunately, there are no photographs um, taken uh, of the front of the house uh, before the war. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we can't really say it just to me, it just looks like the supports. Um, it kind of, it just looks like the supports of the house. Um, I, I just shared another photo um, that kind of shows that um, the front yeah, right yeah, there. Yeah. 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 And so they might've been, so, cause these little areas in here, those, they could very well have been used as like, you know, an, an embrasure for a gun or something like that. Um, I don't, I honestly don't know though, but it, it is something to consider. It is anything is possible. Um, so it very well could it, have been. It's just that it's it's like we've talked about it all the time. It's like every every tank is a tiger and every single rifleman is a sniper. And fortified house is something that comes up a lot yeah. in accounts about D-Day. And you're always gonna go, fortified, or is there someone within it shooting outside, which is not the same thing as being fortified. Fortified to me must mean a deliberate attempt by the defender to to incre to to put armaments inside the building with some kind of provision for defense around them. And, and that, that it may or may not have had that, but it's a it's a dodgy expression that gets used without really anyone understanding what it means. Uh, uh, absolutely, yeah. Not necessarily like, you know... Um... Not necessarily uh, concrete fortified. Stuart, that's just ha a half basement. That's what Stuart, the architect, says. So maybe he's going to add some more about how a house like that is constructed. So Stuart's an architect. But um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> interesting, interesting. Here are some more houses of Le Cé Bleu Don at WN66. I, I, uh, there was another photo once taken that showed this tower from a distance, and someone once said uh, that it was a German tower. It was not. That's, that's used. No, that's something... Right. 
that's used by the yeah that was something erected by the Americans for uh for uh you know uh for being able to direct the beach and such like that. Um, there's that photo of Le Cèbre um, uh, on uh, taken on May nineteenth. See, do I have? To, oh, I just have some. That's a. Well, that's Trevor's a, suggesting it's the coal scuttle entrance. That's another possibility. Although, oh yeah, there aren't. It's mostly wood burning, but that could be for logs, though. It could be for firewood. That's true. Yeah, unfortunately, another, another theory. Another theory. And I, 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 I like the fact that these these shows end up. We answer some questions, but then we raise a whole lot more. That's we? the best way to do it, man. Is just to like ask people to you know and just and find out what happens. That's I have a blueprint of the the Tobruk fifty eight C. Um, here's again, uh, this is after D day, obviously you see the different, so there's a, an entrance down there to the, um, to the cellar and a trench ran from that. Uh, if you remember from yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. The, the map that we were looking at, um, there's Villa St. Cecil way the hell down there still remaining. Um, pretty cool. There's a map. There's another map labeled. So anyway, yeah, that's, uh, again, I would love to get into um, 67, 68A, and 68B, and then, you know, 69 and 70, but it's and, just... And by I, which time, we'll have to go back and do 66 again, and go back and do 71, 72, and 73 again, because you'll no yeah. doubt have found out more stuff to add to the things you did before, and that's the, that is the, um, that's the, that's the interesting about it. So, Old Monkey Bones just asked about what there is to see today. Well, the Sablador has gone. There's a house on the same site now where you can kind of visualize where things were. But that area, as I said, right at the top of the show, there's really nothing there. There's no Tobruk step. There's no none of the concrete wall. There's none of the nope. tank. There's nothing there in 66. You have the, the, the twin embrasure from 67 still up if you come down the coast and want to walk up there. But 66, there's nothing I can, can think of that's, that's discernible today. No, not at all. Um, the n except for the house, the Le Moulin house, um, in from the rear, I don't believe there are any houses that were. Uh, uh, yeah, obviously Le Cèbre is gone. Saint Cecil is gone. Um, you know that that whole stuff. Unlike some of the houses um, around different other parts, as you saw in that one photo, like um, you know the Le Rizano, the house that had the, that had the barrier coming off it, was just shot to hell. So it's like there's no point in keeping these houses when they're just dilapidated and just shot full of holes. So yeah, I, I, I imagine that after the battle, it was just like, okay, just tear everything down. No, definitely, and I think the the the, the takeaway we you know we, we should have again is is that there's a progression and development. There's there's what was there before the war. That was what the Germans initially put in. Then there's the modifications from 43. Then there's what they had by 44 for invasion. Then there was what was at the end of actual D-Day. And then there's what the Americans built after D-Day. Then there's what happens over the next few months when Omaha becomes a, effectively a harbor. And then there's post-war reconstruction. Then there's tourism. And then there's new post-war construction. So you're talking about you know, what's that? What's that? Eight or nine different eras of of development and changes there. So you know, you have to look at this progression rather than saying this thing was there then and now it's not there now. It's 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 not quite as simple as that. Uh, absolutely. Well, here's a good example of that. So, Paul, this is a photo of Stuttgart Saint Laurent taken on D-Day. This is a this is numerous aerial photographs that have all been uh, compiled into one big yeah. thing, and we can zoom in on detail and such like that. However, okay, so. This is an, this this is a number of aerials that was actually taken on D-Day. Here is uh, here are aerials taken after D-Day. So it's the exact same area as yeah. you can see. Boom, boom, and look, the Americans just cleared so much of it. Yeah. So and, as yeah, you like we discussed on the Vierville show, the the fact that the D one draw is not quite where it was because there was excavation on both sides. There was quarrying. There was traffic going up it, and you know you, you have to be very clear when you're looking at your maps to locate where things were now and how they're you know they're, they're not quite in exactly the same place today and, and so mm -hmm. on and so forth so it's a it's a, an ongoing task well we, we will bring the things to an end and just say we'll we'll get some point to um to schedule uh part two and possibly a part three but in the meantime before we do that just tell people where you are with your film because um it's Rivali has won numerous. I can't keep up with how many awards it's it's up to now, but um, it's now available to buy. I've put a couple of links to go. So tell us a little bit, great. do a bit of a plug for your film, Michael. I, I appreciate that, Paul. Yeah. So my film uh, is, it was called Reveille, and it is about uh, an event that happened during the Italian campaign 
of uh, of World War II, so kind of late 1943. And um, let me just try and pull up something here so I can uh, so I can get to it. Um, okay, yeah, um, I'm gonna share my screen one more time. Yeah, Sorry no about problem. That. Uh, share screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks okay, yeah. There we go. So yeah, my film Reveille, it's out on Amazon now. It's a, again, it's about an event that took place uh, between uh, the final months of the Italian camp or, or of the of 1943 during the Italian campaign of the war. Um, so a completely different thing. It's not about Normandy, you know. Surprisingly, it's about the Italian. There were campaign. other campaigns. <laughs> yeah, there were. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but uh, this was a huge undertaking. I'm a filmmaker. I went to film school. This was like my first. This is my first feature film. This was my first huge leap of faith to uh, really, you know, get out there and do what I want to do, which is, um, you know, film and art uh, in when it comes to history, you know, that's, that's what I want to do. And uh, it took a lot of time. We did a lot of work on it and, but we made sure everything was absolutely as accurate as possible. You know, so the, um, when it came to the uniforms, the weapons, uh, we used live fire. So, uh, you know, that was When fun. I read that bit, I was like, holy crap, that's attention <laughs> to detail. I mean, I, I knew you were going to go really detailed about, you know, I love the fact you you show the fact the veteran German soldiers have little bits of stuff left over from North Africa and the younger ones have got, you know, the, yep. the new issued kit. So it's, you know, all those, most of which would not, would just pass over the heads of your, of your average viewer. But that guy who does know his stuff will go, yeah, they've got that right. They've got that right. <laughs> that, you, know, you know, I couldn't find anything. I'm not an expert on the Germans. So I couldn't find anything at all. I was wanting to find one thing. As we always do. Yeah, we always want, like, we, we always search for things that we wanted to stump all of, we wanted to stump us. You know, we wanted to stump those kind of people and say, we did it right. And um, when it came to shooting, like the live fire stuff, obviously, you know, it was done under the safest conditions possible. We wouldn't have done it, you know, if, if, we, if we couldn't. But the reason why we did that is because, Blank ammo versus live ammo, it looks completely different when you do it. Anyone who has shot guns knows that when you shoot a gun, there's a big massive recoil, there's concussion, there's, you know, and there's smoke and all that stuff. And blank ammo, there's no recoil, and you usually get a nice little muzzle flash, but uh um it's just not the same and it does not have the same effect. So we wanted to capture that. We when someone shot a rifle while laying on the ground, we wanted to see that dust kick up and stuff like that. We wanted also, to get that. So must give the actor just an absolute extra level of realism and uh, that that would have just heightened the senses and made it all seem very real. You know, I mean it's like we're not going to get into the the debates about green screen and non these these green screen work, but you know, firing an actor. I, I've I've live fired a Bren gun for a BBC series years and years ago. We were out in Snowdonia on an army range, and they got us up there, and we fired a few rounds, live rounds. Yeah, and it was amazing. And we were at night, so we you know they had the tracer and stuff like that. And it, that's and it, awesome. You know, it does add a whole level. They didn't have to use the footage in the end in the program, but it, we didn't care. <laughs> right, <laughs> playing around with a Bren gun, but I mean, it adds that level of seriousness, which which, you know, you, you need. And I know, you know, I was following the whole story of you making of it, of the casting process and, and the background and, you know, the Germans speak German and, and et cetera, yep. et cetera. You know, you, you've gone to, you've, you've righted most of the things that are wrong about conventional war movies. You've addressed those things that we all, uh, why don't, why are the Germans speaking English with a German accent and why the, you know, or why are the Germans speaking in, British English? And you've, you've taken all that on board and, Clearly, like myself, you're a war movie fan. So yes, you've incorporated all the stuff that annoys you and 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 corrected it. Absolutely. Well, and, and I can't take credit for the whole thing. I mean, I, I I had a lot of people that were helping me with it, and you know, who also had the same goal in mind and wanted to uh, wanted it to come through as well when it came to all that stuff, and wanted to finally see a war movie do it right. But it's the first step. You know, it's just the first step. This was a this was a low budget production, and we knew it was low budget, so we we. Um, we did what we could with the budget we had and we didn't try and overdo ourselves. We didn't try and you know, do a mass huge battle or something like that. The story is minimal. It doesn't need to be grandiose to yeah. get the message across. It's meant to be minimal, but for its minimalism, it has some amazing stuff in it. And I just, I, I see people commenting, Oh, it's not available here on Amazon prime. Unfortunately, as of right now, it is not available outside the U S um, it will be available uh, on Plex and to be and to rent on youtube come november 3rd there you so, are folks you'll get it yeah. eventually and you know and 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 always worth pointing out folks that import uh, supporting independent filmmakers is so important because yes um 
the, the Hollywood productions have millions and possibly billions to throw at projects and independent filmmakers don't. And yet they're judged by the same standards as the money Hollywood put into a big production. And, and that I feel is very unfair when people would look at an indie yeah. movie and say, well, why haven't they got 10 tanks in their bag? And they go, because they, they can only afford one. You know, <laughs> They're doing what they can, man. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. So, well, we'll leave it there, folks. So, um, well, we'll just set a, set, a, set a time for you to come back and do and do the, the second part of this show. In the meantime, good luck with the movie. Can't wait for November when it goes in a wide release. And I say, it's been winning awards left, right and centre. So people are are warming to it, which which must be very gratifying. And uh, and then and it's all setting you up for a Normandy film in the future. Uh, you bet. <laughs> That would be really good. If you need a kind of an on location in Normandy kind of knows a little bit about filming, then you remember this this face. <laughs> hey man, don't don't worry. Like I I, uh, I I I completely you know I know I know the best people when it comes to it. You being one of the the top ones, so I really appreciate everything that you do for you know for people like me and uh, you know for for. Um, continuing your tours and your research and all that stuff it's just freaking awesome man well and thank you for doing your research so folks that will bring it to an end tomorrow i'm here with roger morehouse we're talking about his latest book forgers and then on tuesday liz coward is doing a show nearly live she'll be live but the footage she took was a couple of days ago of shangi over in singapore and the memorial garden there so we've never done a show no we have done a show from singapore with live footage before we're doing another one so liz i'm looking forward to that and then at the end of the week, I'm off to We Have Ways Festival in England. We're meeting up with a lot of you watching in the sidebar. I'll be there uh, on the scrounge for free beers. So that'll be good. So, Michael, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for watching. I will see you all again tomorrow. This is Paul Dad for World War II TV saying enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers, everybody. Bye. <clears throat>